Hey, my name is Sean Sean. I sell art on SeanSean.co, and today we're going to review Rachel Parker. <laughs> I've done this like two or three times. She's a watercolor artist. Uh, she got her start in social work, and then she decided she started selling some stuff on eBay, random stuff, and she decided, hey, maybe I'll sell a painting. And she just started selling a one and went to $30. She got hooked and kept selling art. So she's in watercolor, sells a lot of artwork. And let's get check out her stuff. So the first video is one of her oldest videos. And this is um, how to ship art prints. I think it's from seven, eight years ago. So it's probably going to be grainy. Um, it's probably like 740 versus 1080. I don't know, but we'll see. Let's check it out. I thought that it would be a helpful video to show you guys how I manage my shipping. So here's my Excel spreadsheet and I keep track of everything that I've sold and everything in yellow is what I've sold. So this is really good right off the bat. It's very practical um, how to track your inventory. She has an item number. She has the item description the date she's ordered it, maybe some special instructions. Let's keep going. Then the white is what I still need to ship. And over and I just make like little notes, like someone bought this G clay and they paid $100 down. So I keep track of how much they owe me. And um, when did they order? When did I order the print? Um, so that I can kind of keep track. Oh, that's been waiting since the 17th to be shipped. I need to get that out. All right, let's skip ahead. Be aware I keep my prints. It's just a closet in my upstairs hall. So I keep my prints here and I also have my shipping envelopes. And these are like cardboard shipping envelopes. I buy them off Amazon or eBay or wherever I can find them cheapest. So this is the smaller one for 8x10, and then I stick that inside this slightly larger one, and that seems to work well for my little 8x10 prints. So this is a really cool thing. She's double enveloping, so it's a really strong background for that print. And obviously super cheap, because that's super thin. It's probably like 2 millimeters by whatever the size of the print is, add an extra inch. So it's a really good way to ship your prints. Uh, this is highly recommended. So I kind of double um, envelope them with this these cardboard envelopes so that works well and then for anything over 8x10 I usually just ship it in um, a tube and I buy these off eBay too the next thing I do with my shipping ritual is sign the print so I go to my Excel spreadsheet and find which I figure out which number and this one is 25 Greyhound number 25 so I'm just gonna 25 out of a thousand Rachel Parker so this is really good she's numbering the prints it's interesting she's using pen versus a pencil traditionally artists have done you know, before the 1960s or so, probably. It was always historically done in pencil. I don't know why a lot of pe people still do it in pencil. I would just do it in pen the way she's doing it. It's pretty straightforward. It's nice she's doing it of a thousand. So she's got really high quality art and then she's able to just make these prints and she's probably making a killing <laughs> making the prints versus just the original art. So it's like, wow, man, this is the way to go. For signing my prints, I use this Sharpie pen with a finer point. This is a ballpoint, which I really... Yeah, I would totally use a Sharpie as well. It's the simplest way. I mean, I know Trump kind of tarnished the name of Sharpie by using it, signing presidential documents, but it is a highly reliable doc um, thing. And if you seal it right afterwards with, um, I always varnish mine, so I seal under the varnish on the original painting, and that just sells, so it's not an easy, it's not a hard thing to do, so. I really like it, but they're hard to find, so. So, Mr. Greyhound is all signed and numbered, so I'm going to... Put him in the first little cardboard envelope and I just close that and then next cardboard envelope. And this doesn't have a little sticky seal, which I wish it did, but I'll use um, 
clear tape and I like this um, duck brand, like quack quack duck brand. And this is pretty good um, to use the clear tape to seal it, but I would use a tape gun. Um, let me show you mine. You can buy these, this is way easier to use. I would highly recommend just getting one of these and then you can just pull that tape off like that. And then you just got that piece of tape. So it's, it's a faster system and you get the same type of cut. I don't know what kind of brand is the best. Maybe she has a better view. <laughs> Probably listen to her versus me. Um, I always find these brands are totally inconsistent. I remember Scotch is supposed to be better, but it's kind of breaks more. So I don't know. It's, I don't remember if it's generic or this brand duck or Scotch is the best, but we'll see what she says. It's just really cheap, but <laughs> it's, I actually like it better than the thicker tapes because it, I don't know, it's more pliable. It sticks better somehow. So I think that's pretty clear. She's going to pack it up. Offer online cheaper shipping rates. And I guess that's because you're not using their postal employees time. So it saves them money and it saves you money. So, so this is a really great thing. You get um, the post and then you can get your own scale. Like I have a little tiny scale here. You can plug that in, get the exact weight. You measure the box throw that and then buy the postage that fits that exact box, measure the box first, obviously, and then print it and stick it on there. And you just use the self adhesing. Um, what she's using is this version, which is every 8126. Uh, that's the current brand. They kind of change it over time sometimes, but but you can find that in the office uh, max or buy it online. It's way cheaper. So I would encourage you to just buy it online if you can. Sometimes you find it's cheaper. So I ship the Greyhound and I can color that one yellow because he's done. What if you're shipping like say an 8 by 10? So she's probably going to have a little more details here. I'll just skip to the next video. So this one is how to paint a cat. So let's go check us out. Hello everyone. Welcome back to Rachel's studio. And in today's <laughs> tutorial, we're going to explore yet another black cat with the wet and wet technique. And in this painting, I'm going to use some Sumi ink and some black watercolor paint. And one thing you'll notice right at the bat, she doesn't talk about, but she kind of skims over is she's done a whole series of black cats. So if you're ever uh, painting, I would just encourage if you're going to do one topic and it's kind of from a live animal, like a cat, you might as well just do a series all at once. You're going to get probably a few that are really great. Most are kind of average and a few are bad ones, but you have to do like sometimes a lot just to get a really few good ones. So it's always a great technique. Practice a lot the same topic and you're going to get really masterful. So let's keep going. Uh, she has also a nice setup. You see the straight down um, into the viewing of the canvas or the paper in this case. The picture of the cat she's drawing from so you know what it's going to look like her pot of water, her materials, and she has her watercolors. And right here, I'm just working on uh, getting my masking done. And as usual, I use an old rigger. I get it wet, scrub it in soap, and then dip it in the soap. And I'm just carefully putting in some whiskers. And these whiskers actually came out really great. And I got a really good arc. And I think a lot of that is muscle memory and just practicing a lot. So just practice your whiskers a lot. You might even want to do a little exercise when you're bored of just painting arcs of whiskers on a blank piece of paper just to practice. All right, so let's skip ahead a little bit. This is like 46 minutes. <laughs> Furring out, blooming really soft, like the top of her head and that side of her face on the right side of the painting, her left the right side of the painting. This is going a little longer, let's go faster. It works better if you just, if I, for example, if I put the brush down underneath her ear and just glided it along the edge straight down, never lifting it up until I get to the bottom of the edge uh, down by her feet. That would work better because the paint will fur out anyway and then you don't get those weird little tufts that are sticking out that just don't look like cat fur. <laughs> that doesn't look right. I am going to fix it later. This is actually one of my favorite experiments, the way it turned out. And most of that's because I decided to go in a second time. And So what you can see is she's painting it and then I think she's just recording the voice on top. So this is really smart because you can kind of analyze yourself as you go along and add a lot of details that you might have, um, you might have been focused on the painting, you might miss if you're talking at the same time. The way I do in mine is I'll paint a section, talk about it, paint a section, talk about, paint a section, talk about it, and so I can kind of analyze as I go along. But this is another really good way to do it as a painter, you just do the voiceover right on top. Uh, you see how I left a white highlight along the middle and the inside of her legs? You can do that by just not painting at all. 
and uh, I think I should have put more water and joined those areas a little. They looked too a little bit too racing stripe. It didn't look quite right. But I still love and accept myself. <laughs> so let's go forward a little bit. This is pretty long. The, the water on top of the paper away from the paint. If I move that, will it create a little bit of tiny current that makes the fur fur out a little bit more? Because all the water is connected because it's all wet. So I don't know if you understand what I'm saying, but I, that's what I was trying to do there. I was kind of trying to play in the background, swishing the water, not puddling, but glistening water to see if I could get that fur to kind of draw out a little bit more. Let's just go ahead a little more. I damage the paper if you want to continue to be able to rework it. So I was very delicately touching it with the scrubber when I did use the scrubber. And you just get it wet. And you just kind of dab at the nose and lift out some highlights. Um, blot at it with paper towel if you feel like you need it. <coughs> more. And there I go in with the scrubber again, looking carefully at my reference photo. And you want to compare the length of the nose to another part of the cat's body, say another eye, one of the eyes. So you make sure the nose doesn't get too long. At one point, my nose was way too long. So it's really great because you can see how that's getting closer and closer to the a photo but at the same time remaining very painterly so it doesn't look like a photo it looks like art but it's you know he's, she's getting those fine details kind of zoomed in let's go ahead a little bit basically starting to move into the jewelry stage which is the stage of the painting where I'm refining everything and pulling everything together to make everything hang together nicely and putting in those little details which I call the jewelry to really make the painting shine so here I'm just putting in little wispies and I'll also do the whiskers. And I don't know what kind of brush that is. I didn't get this particular painting filmed while I was doing the whiskers. I went and chose one of the many other paintings I have of Sadie and did the whiskers again so you can see how they look. Now I'm going to work on the eyes. I love how the eyes came out. And I'm going to just do my typical thing where I put in a bunch of clear water I painted carefully around the glint in the eyes, although I do have a little bit of masking in the, gl in the glints of the eyes. So you can either paint around the glints or use masking to create the glints in the eye, little white spots, little white highlights. And I'm going to make this a gradiated eye, which means at the top it's going to be darker, the middle it's going to be medium, and the bottom it's going to be lighter and almost always that formula works for creating really beautiful cat's eyes and so i'm floating in some windsor violet windsor violet windsor newton green gold paint now if you don't have green gold so yeah this is this green gold paint i use it recently because i heard about it and i'm like eh, i'm not really sold on it yet but it definitely, she knows how to use it, <laughs> so follow her. Let's go on to her next video. All right, these are about watercolor hacks, so let's see what this is about. So this time we're actually gonna see her, so that's a really strong start. I've got hacks for you. Lots of hacks, never before seen hacks. Don't forget to watch to the very end so you can watch all my bloopers. There's a lot. Hi everyone, welcome back to Rachel's studio. And in today's video, I am going to share with you 13 hacks to up your watercolor painting game. So I really like how she starts the video just straight on visual. So you see the back, her painting behind her. I should have my painting behind her. I'm not that clever. <laughs> Actually, I'm just like in a shoe closet, so I can't really do it. But yeah, she has her art behind her. So that's the best way to kind of sell your art in the background without selling it. So to say you're talking to the camera, you're giving them hacks and tricks to artists that are trying to become watercolor artists at the same time they might be buyers as well so it's a really smart way to go and then she goes straight into the materials here jump right in with my first hat all right the first tip that i want to share with everybody is poster tack here is some poster tack i got off amazon there's lots of different poster tack and it goes by a lot of different names but poster tack is great to use when you need a way to hang your wet brushes up so they can dry properly you just attach the poster tack to any hard surface Stick your wet brushes on and voila, you have a way to properly hang and store your brushes. Nor so you can just lay them flat. You don't really need to um, hang them this way. You can eat, you can lower them flat. That's how I do, just lay it flat on the table. The water drip out and it won't get into the bristles. Uh, this is a really clever way. Um, I've never seen it before. You would definitely need a lot of different hanging things. She has a really tight 
studio just using watercolor she can paint very small very tidy so it's a really cool thing and she has a really great window so she's getting really great light to paint um, her painting so that's really cool normally i just keep them in a cup with the tips up which isn't very good for the health of my brushes because the water then runs down into the ferrules and over time will ruin the brushes so get that poster tack for better brush health and good studio organization. Yeah, I would definitely stay organized. It's a very important um, tactic that really helps painting. Like right now I'm very disorganized because I'm at my dad's house and I don't really have a set studio. So I can't really organize the space I want and have it, you know, I have to keep it protected from the dog because it's just an open space the dog can run through. So I have to keep all my tight periods kind of like break down the studio, open the studio, break down it. So that's a real pain in the ass. If you can have a set studio where you have your paints in one area, your brushes in another area, your colors in a certain way, and just keep that well organized and stay to a system that's going to be really key to a really high production. I used to have a studio, two different studios, and that makes a huge difference if you can organize your stuff right away every time and not have to break it out every time that way. Hack number two, Micropore 3M Medical Surgical Tape that has been invaluable to me. It's been a problem that has plagued me forever. Ever since my Duck brand masking tape uh, company changed their formula for their tape. So this is really cool technique. I always wonder what the hell kind of tape artists use because I'm like, are they using artist tape or are they using masking tape? And I've used masking tape and it tends to tear the paper and I've seen other videos where they're using masking tape. I'm like, how the hell is that working? <laughs> and if you use other tapes, it's like the paint gets underneath the tape. So it's a real nightmare. So I would definitely listen to that. Let's uh, skip ahead a little bit. The masking and here's what's left behind. And here's another painting that I recently did with my Patreon students where I applied the whiskers and little flyaway details on this little kitten. And here is what it looks like after the masking has been removed. And you get really fine, detailed, thin lines. So it's really good. She has like the title at the top of the screen that says mask with the calligraphy dip pin. So you can kind of take notes at a leisurely pace. You don't have to be like, what was that? What was that? Rewind, look at that. She just has it up for a while. And so you can really just kind of leisurely take notes as you watch the video, really enjoy the video. So I really like that pacing. And then use it like a stamp and then create beautiful paintings. Let's look at one. And here is an example of a painting that she did. She created all these trees in this painting just by stamping them with her little stamp. She stamps the trees and then while they're still wet, she will spray them just a little bit on the top and let that drip down to the bottom of the painting. So that's kind of a cool technique. Uh, let's go to the next one. A little tight, so I just sprayed it and I sprayed it in that upper right quadrant and right away it looks softer, more lush, more natural, a little bit more random and it starts to look more like a tree that has a movement in it. So this is a really cool technique. In watercolor you want to have really tight edges. You can see the tree trunk is very tight because that's uh, watercolor on top of just dry paper in the top it's she's painted and then she's added the water so it kind of blends it and makes that smooth effect so that's a really good technique fur textures grass textures trees a lot of natural textures anytime you need a stripe this is your brush let's see the wisp brush in action here is the painting that i'm going to demonstrate this technique on and this it's a really beautiful a artwork leg under the darker cats head is the one I'm going to demonstrate. So here's my wisp brush and I'm just painting on some fur. I use sometimes I use it in a flat orientation and sometimes I use it in a side orientation to get different textures. Hack number seven is a bokeh sponge created by the Art Sherpa. She designed it for use with acrylics but I've been playing with it with my watercolor and it's a really neat tool. So that's kind of a cool thing here. It used to be a great little tool and it was really perfect for creating circles in a whole different variety of applications including making this cute little flower. What do you think? So this is really cute. She's wearing, she has a really nice background with her art in the background, really clean studio. It doesn't look realistic. I would have mess everywhere. And it's like some artists are very messy. Some are very clean. Um, so I'm not sure what to make of that. It has a really sharp visual. It looks very commercialized. And, you know, she has a beautiful print um, scarf on. Very colorfully decorated. Or <laughs> decorated. <laughs> She's put on cosmetics and look, you know, put herself in the best light, obviously. So she looks clean and beautiful to kind of accentuate her beautiful artwork. So I'm kind of on the fence on this. You can do it really gritty, kind of very artistic look, but at the same time you can do much more put together, very polished, really fine. It's kind of a hard to say what um, is right for each artist. I, maybe for this particular art, you want to be 
very highly stylized because your work is highly detailed. So, you know, it probably depends on the style of the work. So I'll leave it up to you guys to figure out which is the best. Hey, comment if you can think of other ways to use it. You can also use glitter eyeshadow for this hack. The gum Arabic glitter. Oh my God. <laughs> I used a little toothpick just to mix it up. So the gum Arabic acts as a binder and it helps it stick to the paper even after everything dries. So a really nice detail zoom here. Glitter onto your painting. It will just brush off. But because of the gum Arabic added, it will stick to your paper. It's almost like a glue that sticks whatever it is. Okay, we get that point. Let's go on. To make your watercolor paint workable for a longer amount of time. So it's going to take a while to dry. So let it completely dry. After that, you can paint over it as usual. This is pretty amazing where she's actually erasing the paint. Um, it's obviously a huge problem in watercolor. Normally you put the color down and you're lost the um, ability to get white back but here she's figured out a way to kind of erase the color on top and get those white back and she's using this gum arabic um as a mask on the bottom layer where it is white waste of the paint layer rise and then she's rubbing it off and then getting that white pure, pure white back so that's really cool white ink there's all kinds of white things you can use to paint white back into your watercolor painting for you new watercolor artists try to use the white of your paper for your whites. But if your whites get covered up, for example, maybe you forgot to mask out your whiskers or you need a glint in your eye, you could try this hack. So this is a pretty good hack. Uh, I'm gonna end it here and do the summary. I gotta have a phone call, so unfortunately I have to cut it short, but I think it's a really great video. Um, definitely a strong artist. I think she has a really great watercolor technique. She's highly focused on watercolor only. So really, really niche down for Google and YouTube and obviously selling, it's easier if you're niche down versus having a variety of work. So if you can niche down to one particular style, like acrylic or maybe a particular theme or style, you know, that really makes a difference in being able to break through the market and then be able to sell a lot. And then later, maybe you expand your styles, but start with one style. It's probably the best policy. I haven't done that myself, so <laughs> don't follow my example, follow someone else. But I think later you can expand more broadly after you get kind of established um, you can kind of start experimenting a little bit see if your audience likes it um, but yeah i think she's a really strong artist great visual uh, videos you know she's got a lot of nice headshots on her tips here um, i think i'd have a little more headshots on some of the more explaining how a painting works uh, a lot of painters don't do that for some reason they just like show you the materials and start and i'm like why don't you show your face you're trying to sell yourself it's kind of a weird thing because, you know, they buy you first as a person and then they buy your art. Obviously, if you have great art, it's easier to sell, but it, it helps if you show your personality, I think. Um, really great artist, I think. You know, you can learn a lot. She's obviously selling very well and doing well as an artist, so definitely follow some of her tips. I think I would highly recommend Rachel Parker, and that's my critique of Rachel Carter. Thanks for watching, guys.